I developed. I mean, it just when it, when I first dawned on me that you know we were not teaching uh, kids how to learn in the classroom. I'm okay. Well, you know, what are some good ways to to teach? And of course, uh, Robert Diltz, I think, is the one that originally modeled out a spelling strategy. And so we had that, um, but we need more than that. And so basically, how these were developed was that I had an ongoing question with anybody that comes to see me, is what is it that you have trouble doing? What is it that you're slower at than anybody else? What is it that you have to work too hard to learn? What is it that you don't like to learn? And so as they share those things with me, you know, at the first I go, okay, somebody would have trouble with spelling, I go, okay, what has to happen in order to learn a spelling word? What, you know, what, what has to happen in the brain in order to learn a math fact? What has to happen in the brain? So to, to, before I could get to those particular strategies, I had to go find out what has to happen in the mind in order for a student uh, to, to remember stuff, to have a good memory so that they can remember all that data, all those facts and things that they're supposed to memorize in school. So when I stopped to think about learning, as far, particularly as far as school is concerned, I said, well, first of all, one of the things that, that causes people to struggle is that half the time they don't know where they're putting the information. You know, they'll, they'll get some information that they're supposed to remember and it just kind of goes right over their head. It's kind of like the name remembering strategy. You know, you go up and shake somebody's hand, they give you give you their name and you're thinking about what am I going to say or what do they think about me and you never deliberately store the information anyways. So we basically have five choices if, if we're going to store uh, the five senses that we have. And I'm throwing out two of them like the smell and taste because we probably in an academic classroom setting don't want to use smell and taste. So we have, we have three choices remaining. We can learn visually and or we can learn auditorily and or we can learn kinesthetically. Kinesthetically has two components. Kinesthetic is about tactile learning where it's hands-on like basket weaving or sports or typing or something like this. Or kinesthetic is emotional learning where you get emotionally involved in something in some sort of way. Um, if you stop to think about kinesthetic learners, now most kinesthetic learners are the bane of our classrooms because they can't sit still. <laughs> You know, they're up moving around. They'll break their pencil lead so that they can go over and walk over and, sh and sharpen it. Um, and a lot of teachers have trouble with them because they're so fidgety. And they, they move around a lot, and they need to be active. Uh, it's very difficult to be a kinesthetic learner in the, what I call the academic subjects. I'm not talking about kinesthetic learning is not valid and not useful. If you're taking typing, if you're in sports, if you're taking things that are hands-on, then kinesthetic learning it has a necessary component there. But when you're taking math and science and history and subjects like this, to be a kinesthetic learner is going to um, cause you to be a slower student. Or you're going to have more trouble because it just is a slow way to learn the academic subjects. That's pure and simple. That's all it is to it. I mean, you can get emotionally involved with your history lesson or you can get emotionally involved with your a uh, math lesson or something like this, but it takes a lot of creativity to figure out how to do it, and it takes a long time to figure out how to do it too. So by the time you're figuring all that stuff out, everybody else is way past you. Now, let me, let me stop here for a moment and, and make this comment. I'm about to um, fly in the face of the, the learning style theorist because they believe that you ought to respect, find out if a student is a visual learner, or an auditory learner, or a kinesthetic learner, and respect where they're coming from and teach to them. I think if we allow students to be kinesthetic learners in the academic subjects in the classroom, if we allow them to be auditory learners, we are relegating them to be poor students. If we're going to take on the responsibility of teaching students how to learn in the academic subjects, then it's our responsibility to teach them world-class strategies, wor the strategies that work the best that they can be, the best that they can work. If they are a natural kinesthetic learner, then we need to step back and teach them how to be a visual learner. If they're an auditory learner naturally, we need to step back and teach them how to be a visual learner. If they're already a visual learner, then it's a piece of cake. Man, we can just turn their life around in no time, just like that. What I mean by an auditory learner here an auditory learning is useful, like if you're a singer or if you're an actor or something like this and you're trying to capture, you know, the, the uh, accents and things like this of somebody's voice or the way special tonalities that they use, it's really useful to use that. But the way most people 
attempt to do auditory learning is that they repeat something over and over and over again. So they take a, you know, a word like um, student, for example, and say, I'm going to learn how to spell student. And they go, student, S-T-U-D-E-N-T, student, S-T-U-D-E-N-T. Or you know, the teacher will come along and say, well, write it down 10 times. Well, do you know what the typical student does when you say write something down 10 times? They go, OK, S, 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 like that. And then they go, T, T, T. You think they're learning a spelling word when they do something like that? Not at all. And see, when they're just sitting there spelling something, like if they're saying storage, S-T-O-R-A-G-E, storage, S-T-O-R-A-G-E, it becomes a mindless, repetitive thing that does not do anything to the mind at all. I mean, you have no clue what's going on inside it. You don't know where their mind is. Usually their mind is someplace else. Okay? And besides that, it's very slow. It's very tedious. It's very almost painful to a lot of people. And it just doesn't work very well for the academic subjects, pure and simple, in, in my opinion. This is my opinion. Now, when you think about visual learners, <coughs> visual learning is the fastest way to learn that there is. It's the most comprehensive. The old, the old statement that a picture is worth a thousand words is not even correct. It's worth far more than a thousand words. I mean, if you, um, I, th I think one of the ways to, to get an, an example of the, the beauty and the value of visual learning, that's for example with this painting right here, if you just take a picture of it in your mind's eye, you know, you can, you can take five seconds to take a picture of that and then close it and re close your eyes and recognize that you do have a good picture of that in your mind's eye. Now, what I want you to do is to open your eyes back up and I want you to get a tape recorder out. I'm kidding, don't do that. Get a tape recorder out and I want you to describe that picture in as much detail as you have in your mind's eye. How long would it take you to describe this painting with the detail that's there or the detail that's in your eye, the, those of you that can make that kind of picture? Take you a long time, wouldn't it? To me, that's a, that describes basically the difference between visual learning and auditory learning. I mean, auditory learning, it's like your, your mind is, has a tape recorder going in it. And if you want to go back and remember how I started this presentation, you've got to go zzz, run it back, run your mind back and find it. Auditory learning is very linear, one word at a time. Visual learning is, is a one-time picture thing. You get all that stuff in one picture in your mind, you can zip any place you want to in that picture to find it. If I want to know what's up here, I go there. If I want to know what's there, I go down there. If you wanted to do that with the audio tape that you have in your mind, you'd have to replay all the words that you used to describe you know, until you got to the point that you were describing down here. Now, um, most of the kids of today, most of the students of today, are very visual anyway. It's in my experience that they are, even the ones that are at risk. I mean, when I go into an alternative school, um, I will have some of the teachers say, well, you know, Johnny over here is, um, is a kinesthetic learner. And so he's got to have stuff that he can get his hands on and stuff like that. And when I go in and assess them, I find out that, yeah, he does do, <clears throat> does do a lot of kinesthetic things, but he has a visual lead going on in his mind that they should be accessing, they should be using, because that will get him into the kinesthetic even better. So my deal is that if you're going to learn something in the academic subjects, you need to be a visual learner. You need to, um, need to train the kids that you're going to work with to be visual learners, or whatever, whatever it takes, but get them into the visual field. And we'll be talking more about how to do that uh, as we progress. The other thing that has, to, that has to be there in order for memory to work is that you've got to make sure that if you're going to make a picture of something, how do you know you have a good picture? And one of the ways, one of the tricks that I use to start students off with is that I, I will have them work with spelling words, and I'll have them take a word, you know, like the word, um, let's say, the, if, depending upon their age, have them take the word like, um, like let's say, positive right here. I would take the word positive and I say, I want you to form a picture of that in your mind's eye. And then as they form the picture of that in their mind's eye, like positive, and then I say, okay, spell T backwards. E-V-I-T-I-S-O-P. If they can do that, if they can spell a word backwards like that off the picture that they have in their mind, then I know that they have an excellent picture and that, and that it's steady, stable, and they can see it very well. 
I notice some of you practicing stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me go ahead and do something, and you'll have an ample chance to practice spelling words backwards. Does anybody, let me stop for a minute and say, does anybody disagree with that? You can't do it auditorily very smoothly. If I say to a student, you know, spell that word backwards, and they go into an auditory strategy, it will sound and look like this. Okay, positive, positive. Uh, e V positive. E V I T positive. I positive. S O P. And so it's like they're sounding it out over and over again. And it's um, and besides that, you take a word like positive, and it it looks about like it sounds. You take a word like Albuquerque, and it doesn't look like it sounds. Or you take a word like phonics, doesn't look like it sounds. It always slays me when I hear people talking about learning spelling words phonetically. You can't even spell phonetically phonetically. Exactly. I mean, it just doesn't work, doesn't work at all. Yes, bro. So, I'm, I'm <coughs> I agree to everything you said, and I'm trying to practice with myself. Now, I can have a picture in my mind's eye, visual picture of uh, pictures with everything to put in details. I can hold the words and no matter which, which language, but to uh, say it phonetically the right way. Let's say from English, from left to right, I can hold the word from Hebrew, from right to left. I cannot say uh, hold it uh, backwards. I missed the, the middle part. I know that you addressed it in one of your tapes. I am practicing with that. Again, I have no problem from left to okay. right. So when I get to the point that we do that, let me, let me use you as a demonstration. We'll see what's going on. I mean, that happens with some people. Because I, can, I close my eyes, I can remember everything on this picture. I can remember everything here into the smallest details. OK. So for example, give me a. About a four or five letter word that you know how to spell. OK, I started with my name even. OK, your name will work. So do you have a picture of your name in your mind's eye? Can you picture what it looks like? Yes. OK, what's the last letter? OK, I have A, but I have to go from left to right. OK, I know. but just, OK. So just get the picture of the word. Come up here. <laughs> <clears throat> Get over here on this side, if you will. Okay. Well, I, I will take another one, you know. With my name, it's not so. I know. All right, so I want you to picture the name Perla. In fact, okay. put it in two syllables, like per and then la. Okay. Right? And I want I'm gonna do it this way first. So take the la and spell it backwards. A L. And the per and spell it backwards. Okay, I need still to go from left to right first. R E P. Okay. Now, can you hold that picture steady in yes. your mind's eye? Yes. All right. So now I want you to hold that picture steady in your mind's eye and I want you to what's the last letter? A. R. No. No. Now so, you have to go back. Okay. No. So now, are you holding it steady? When yes. you hold it, okay. So when you hold it steady, tell me what the um, second letter is. E. Tell me what the next, the last letter is. L. Tell me what the last letter is. A. Tell me what the first letter is. P. Okay. Now, the last letter is. A. Next, right before that. Okay, I have to go from left to right. Okay, so what happens to the picture? What what co does the picture go away? No. W what happens to it? That you have to do it from left to right again. Just try it one more time. What I want you to to do is when you when you put that up there and you say, okay, I got a picture of it, and so far every time we started to spell it backwards, you said, wait a minute, I have to restate it. Restate it. Right. I take it you're restating it to reactivate the picture. Is that true? Well, no, it's there, but it, in the middle it's fuzzy. 
Okay. How big is your pitcher? Uh, like this. Okay. On, on the wall, like a, like a banner. Okay. Is there any way, you have skills, is there any way you can defuzz or clear up the fuzz on the middle of it? Make it bigger? Make it a different color? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. All right. So do that. Now, now hold the picture steady in your mind's eye and spell it from right to left. A-L-R-E-P. Give her a hand. <laughs> now, this, this is a good demonstration as far as I'm concerned. Uh, if you don't say, well, sure you can, or, or you're dumb because you can't do this, it's like, what's going on in her mind that th she thinks that she can't do this? It's, and sometimes it's an awareness thing. I and need so, more, more color. I need it. Yeah, the so you, ch you, change the, you change the submodalities, you change the way that she's represented it. Anything that will change the way that she was representing it will help her gain control of it because what she has is a habit that says, when I put it up there in the way that I've been putting it up there, it gets fuzzy. We'll give her some other ways. What's this about more choices better than one choice? So give her some other ways to represent it, and a lot of times the problems just simply go away. Now what I would do with Perla is that I would keep practicing her on like four to five to six letter words, and then gradually I would move them up to longer and longer words. And we're going to have a chance to do that, so we'll... I'll do, do it okay. in the evening. Okay. Well, no, you're going to do it in class. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, doctor, I presume that the, the mind wor uh, works two ways, uh, from right to left and left to right, uh, depending on the language. Like in Arabic, we write from right to left, and mm -hmm. from right to left, and English, no. um, <laughs> and visually it doesn't make any difference. I mean, when, you, when you're looking at a word, yeah, there's a left to the right, and there's a right to the left, and the dyslexias don't care. You know, they read it both ways. But you, you have the word displayed there, and, and when, you, when you are doing it auditorily to, to, do, to have it displayed correctly auditorily, you've got to do it in, in the United States, you have to do it from, from left to right. And you're saying in Arabic, you have to do it the other way, right? I, I have my book translated into Chinese, by the way. If you want to have a weird experience, you know, pick up that book and notice that they start at the back. You know, and then they have all these Chinese characters in there that go vertically. We start from the back. Okay. We, we read from right to left. Mm -hmm. So there are cultural differences. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Last time, something. <coughs> there, the big, uh, presumption is that the student already knows how to spell the word because they couldn't visualize it unless they already know how to spell it. Right. And what I'm doing when I'm trying to get them into visualization, get them into being aware that they can visualize, I don't want to confuse it with a spelling strategy, so I go with words that they already know. So after they know that they can visualize words, after they know that they can spell them backwards, after they're, that's a sub, what I call a sub-skill, once they're, they're sure of themselves in that sub-skill, now we're ready to move into, here's a spelling strategy, you know. So this basically is a technique in helping children to learn how to visualize. Yeah, and or to become aware that they are visual. Sometimes they, they, they just don't know. They, they have these pictures running around, they don't even know they have them. Okay. So that's my way of, of making sure that they have a quality picture in their mind's eye. And what I will do is get them to do it because if, when they practice spelling words backwards or numbers backwards, for example, what they will do is uh, get more and more confidence in their ability to do that. And the longer and the longer the word gets, the more confidence they'll get. After a while, they'll just pick up a word and they'll just look at a word and turn around and they got it right there. And they, and they know what a good quality picture looks like. And so they don't have to spell it backwards anymore because they know they have a high quality picture in their mind's eye. Yes? Two, two things that popped into my mind. Um, one is that spelling a word, as soon as I'm trying to speak it, I'm moving back to the auditory. And so I'm realizing that I'm having difficulty holding the visual and speaking at the same time. Yeah. Because um, it's moving back to the auditory. But a question that also came up um, think about the eye accessing, eye accessing cues. Does it help someone to visualize to actually intentionally focus the eyes higher? Um, let me explain what the words eye accessing cues mean. 
two people and then let, answer your question. What Don is talking about, and this will be a good thing for you to be aware of, because you're, you're about to go into small groups and you're about to spell words backwards. You're going to practice this. Because, you know, if you try to get a student that you're working with to spell a word backwards and you don't know how to do it, you don't know how to tell them if they're right or wrong. So we better make sure you guys can do it before we send you out into the world. <laughs> but I accessing cues are about how you go to pull information out of your brain. Okay? So whenever, you're, whenever you are accessing images in your mind's eye, some people will look up and to the, their left or up and to their right to pull it out. So you'll ask somebody to, you know, do you know how to spell the word Albuquerque? And a lot of times they'll go, oh, yeah. And their eyes go up there to find the word and pull it down into what I call RAM, you know, uh, short-term memory. Um, whenever you ask them to, about a sound, like do you remember the, is my voice deeper or, or in pitch than your brother's or your father's? Then what their eyes will do is typically go straight to the left one way to remember this is toward, towards either ear. Or down and to the left. A lot of times you'll see people's eyes going back and forth like that, and they're accessing auditorily whenever you, you see that kind of an eye movement. And again, it's, it's the, the blood that's been shown, this is not NLP stuff, but some... Stanford uh, University neurological report came out one time that I read that said uh, that notice that when people move their eyes to different spatial locations that blood went to different parts of the brain which means it's activating different parts of the brain where this is this stuff is, is. they go down and to the right it's kinesthetic and it's when they're into feelings or how something tactically feels so as you're working this uh, little exercise that we're going to do here in a minute um, you know, it'd be a good time for you to practice watching where they go with their eyes in order to do something. So if I'm asking the student to spell something and they're going down here, what they're trying to do is get a feel for it. Or if they're going down here and they're trying to sound it out. Or if they're going back and forth, they're trying to sound it out. So when I'm, when I'm working with somebody on the spelling strategy, one of the very first things that I do is use the eye axis and cues to figure out how is this student attempting to do the, the the, the word. How are they attempting to store the word? How are they attempting to pull it out of their brain? How do they attempt to spell it? And then I know if I have to teach them my spelling strategy or not. <clears throat> I'll put this up on the wall so that you can <coughs> have it. Yes? Um, that if you're a speller, that you should check to see what your Um, looking up to the left is um, where you have memory stored. Looking up to the right is where you are creating something visually. Unless you're flipped like her. Unless you're flipped like her. <laughs> um, some, some, some people are different, but for the normal population. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be different. Than <laughs> up and to the left is where the visual memory is. Now, this kind of goes to Don's question. When I'm asking Perla, for example, to hold that picture in her mind's eye, she doesn't have to go up here and, and pull it out. This is the accessing cue. This is not where she represents it. Most people, when they, after they pulled it down, they'll see it right out there in front of them. So, and that's not necessarily an accessing cue. That's just like, where do they hold that so that they can work with it? OK. Robin? Last year, I mentored a student, and she was very lucky to be in second grade. And you know, they would have them write the words over and over and over. And she could get her spelling words from that. And I taught her how to she was just, she had so much fun with it. She was a kid with a new toy. Yeah. And she just thought it was Now that's, um, it's amazing how many kids would come in and their parents are sitting there uh, watching them and, and listening to them and the parents' jaws dropping because the parent can't do some of the words that they do, can't do them backwards. So it's a, it's a real good way to break the belief set that the parent has that my kid's stupid or my kid's lazy or my kid can't do anything, is to have them watch this. So. 
Okay, what do you guys do with all these questions here? <laughs> okay. Yes. I was just going to share with you that I, I worked with a dyslexic student in, in New Zealand last year who was exactly the strategy. And um, she, she was getting one out of ten for spelling. She was eight. And, um, and, and it worked so quickly that her mother nearly fell off the chair because this kid, we, we used tsunami because I used a word that wasn't easy to, you know, and she mm -hmm. spelt this word backwards just straight away. Yeah. And it went from one, to one out of ten to ten out of ten consistently until she stopped doing it. Yeah. Yeah, we made a real game of it and did, took it a bit sure. further. Yeah. Good way to do it. Let me, let me put you in, a, in an exercise. This is one of those quickie little exercises that I want you to do just, just to kind of uh, um, get you used to the to spelling words backwards and have you experience what it is that you're going to ask your, your students to, to do. Yes, first. I just need to clarify before I go into the exercise. Uh, we do not ever suggest that they store it in a certain way. Just ask them to store it and let them naturally store wherever. Right? Um, well, sometimes I will, um, when I'm teaching the spelling strategy, and we're not at the spelling strategy yet, but when, when I'm working with somebody with a spelling strategy, and they keep going down here to access it, for example, I will refer to their magic spot. And so I may say, may get a piece of paper and say, um, okay, now I want you to, here, here's the word right, I may show it to them right here. Here's the word right here. and and. I want you to always, whenever you're trying to pull a word up, this is where, this is your magic spot right here. And I train them and being and looking up to where, you know, where they can visualize the word because they're stuck down here in kinesthetic lots of time. All right. Um, here's what I want you to do. In groups of four to five, get a little circle. And the deal here is that I want you just to practice spelling words backwards, Okay. So it will, it will go like this. We'll, I, whoever is in our group, I'll turn to June, and I'll say, June, do you know how to spell the word? And I want you to start off with like four to six letter words, if, unless somebody wants you to go less than that. You can't go down to one, <laughs> one letter word. Uh, you have to at least do two. Um, so I go to June, I say, June, do you know how to spell horse? H-O-R-S-E. Okay. Now get it in your mind's eye and spell it backwards for me. Okay, and the rest of us go, way to go, June. Yay! And then, so do you know how to spell the word um, student? Yes. Okay, spell it for me. S-T-U-D-E-N-T. -E okay, can you get a picture of that, like stew and then dent? Spell dent backwards for me. And spell stew backwards. U -S. Good. And we go, where to go? Okay. And then I go to everyone in my group. I, I, I do. I give them a word that they know how. And again, keep it four to six to seven letter words. It gave you a harder one, didn't I? I didn't realize it. And, I, and then we rotate. So now June gets to give everybody a word. And now I want you to move up to eight to ten letter words. Okay. And they can break it out into, into you know, like if you take a word like um, um, retrieval, like re and then tree and then evil, something like that. And just kind of do it syllable by syllable like we did here. Okay? So we go around about three times in which you are uh, giving everybody a word. So you have three experiences of being able to take a word up to 8 to 10 to 12 letter words. Then I want you to do it this way. After you've done three words a piece, making them harder and harder, more complex, then I want you to do this. Um, I'm going to give you my, a telephone number that I have. Okay? And I want you to image it in your mind's eye. And I'm going to repeat it to you several times. And when you think you have a really good image of that telephone number, I'm going to want you to spell it backwards. Like, for example, I'll give her one that I used to have. It's, Nine four two four three seven one. Nine four two four three seven one. One seven three four two four nine. And we go, way to go, June. And then she turns and gives the person on her left a telephone number that she has. And she turns and gives a person on her left a telephone number. 
So it's just so that you can experience the difference in imaging letters and imaging numbers. Those of you with European numbers, please limit them to uh, about half of the number. <laughs> <laughs> and no writing down. Yeah. And I don't care if it's a valid number or not. You just need to be able to remember it so that you got, know that they got it right. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm working with an ESL student. I'm working with an ESL student, for example, or a person that doesn't know how to spell it. I say, can you, does it have to be something they know how to spell it? In this exercise, yes. Okay. Yeah. Because otherwise I would have to show them the word. Uh, no, that, that's later on in the, okay. in the spelling strategy. For now, it's just you getting used to visualizing. Okay. So after you've done three words in your circle and one telephone number, just so you have that different experience, I mean, if you really want it, here in the United States, we have a thing called a Social Security number <laughs> that we could, we could try out on each other. But let's don't do that. Let's, no. To give you one experience of a number. Yes? Okay, knowing that we can only take in five to nine pieces of information at a time, or a number at a time, does mm -hmm. that affect the learning strategy? Yeah, so the question is the fact that we can only visualize, you know, five to nine, supposedly five to nine pieces of information at the same time. What I do when I spell something long, and this, is, this takes practice to do it, but you get an image of the word, and I always break them down into syllables. And then once I know that I have an image of each of the syllables, then I start over here on the right, and I just scroll across. So I don't have to even know what's over here at the first part. I just start, and I know that that, that word's going to be there when I get there. I mean, one of the ways to think about that is, is to um, take this. Can, can, you, can you start spelling from here to here without knowing what the first part is? As soon as I remove my hand, I mean, when you get here. So we can say, spell this backwards, L-A-V-E-I-R-T-E-R. -E -E and that's the way my mind works. And it t took me a little practice to get there to be able to do that. So practice is what you need, right? So get with somebody different than who you've been with, by the way. And I'm going to give you, um, we'll give you 15 minutes for this exercise. So look at your, look at your watch and. Um, I have one question that I heard asked several times and was asking me, is it okay to close your eyes? Absolutely. Um, a lot of times, some people, when you ask them to visualize something like this, they, um, if they have their eyes open, they, they, they get the external visual field confused with what they're trying to do on the inside. So if they'll close their eyes, I mean, they can, a lot of times they can do it with eyes closed but not open. So um, what I noticed when Donald was doing it, his with letters, He's right there. He's so fast. And then when we went to phone numbers, he's Mr. Auditory Man anyway. He was like, he was. I mean, how, what do you do when you get to? He, the, he was what? He was. It was. Um, he never got to the point where he could actually see the numbers. Numbers affects people differently. I mean, there, there are some people can do numbers easier than letters, and vice versa. So uh, my question was actually more: Is it because it was a telephone number? Possibly is that like a some kind of a who, who knows? To be lots of things, and, and what, what I will do, there's a computer program out, by the way, that, that will uh, generate, and I can't think of the name of it right now, but I will, that will just generate different sequences of random letters or numbers, and they'll flash it, and then you have to, the, the student has to remember it, and then type it back in backwards, which is a good one. I used to just put them on a piece of paper, and I just flash a piece of paper at them, you know, trying to get them to make pictures without stopping and analyzing it. So you put, you put something on a piece of paper or a card, let them see it for a moment, and then take it away, depending upon where they are. You might do it at first, you know, it's kind of slowly, but then you want to get them to do it faster and faster, where they're just taking a picture in their mind's eye and holding that picture. Now, how many letters and, and, or numbers are you talking about? Depends on the student. If you're talking about a younger student, then you may do two to three letters. I'll, there's a the tape that you're going to um, have an opportunity to see called the Ryan tape. This is about a young man that I work with by the name of Ryan. And he was 18 years old. And uh, make a long story short, he couldn't spell cat. And he didn't know two times two. And he's about to graduate from high school, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and one of the things that, that um, um, 
I, what I did with him, uh, he, didn't, he didn't realize that he was supposed to visualize letters and words and numbers. He would, if you say tree, he'd get a picture of a real tree. The, uh, the concept of putting a bunch of letters in there in the picture never dawned on him. So one of the things that I did was I said to him, I said, Ryan, do you know what the letter T looks like? And he went, of course, you know. And so what, tell him, telling somebody to visualize something is different than saying, do you know what something looks like? So within a space of probably five minutes, I went T, and he said, yeah, I know what it looks like. O, do you know what O looks like? Yeah, OK, if you have a T and an O like this, what does that spell? And he said, two. And I said, <clears throat> if you have, you know what the letter W looks like? And he said, of course. And I said, OK, if you have a T-W-O, what does that spell? And he said, two. And so got him around to the town, the word town, and then I had him spell it backwards. He had heard me having students spell Albuquerque backwards. He says, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so he, he got the word town, and I had him say, what's the last word? What's the word, the letter right before that, the letter right before that, the letter right before that. And his eyes started getting wider and wider. This is, a, this is an amazing tape. It's a poor quality video tape, but it's something that if you, wanna, if you want a, um, an experience of how far you, uh, of the type of students that the, the world has, has dismissed. They just say this is impossible, that one can't learn. And how fast it is to turn them around. This, this happened probably in a little over an hour. But this kid was spelling Albuquerque backwards. He was doing multiplication facts and like, just like that, you know, in space of, and I think <coughs> Cash is going to um, make a presentation on the Ryan tape for you, because he, he happened to be there at the time that we were doing that. Any other questions about? Yes. I was just going to make a comment that we had trouble, I think, with the numbers because uh, we didn't because we didn't see them. If we had the number in front of our eyes and then had it taken away, it would have been up there. But no. we were trying to picture the numbers. Yeah, that's a good point. Us, and that's, why we're that's an excellent point. I, I, I thank you for pointing that out. I failed to mention that when you went to numbers, you're now moving to a different skill level. You now are learning to listen visually because you're having to take what somebody is saying to you and overlap it and make a picture. And so when I get students to do that, I always make that distinction because one of the things that I want them to learn to do is listen to the teacher's lecture visually too. It's not just about reading stuff. It's about, you know, becoming a visual learner completely. And so that's doing that little deal with the numbers is usually my first step in having them say, here comes the information in. Now can I, can I make a picture of that? That's a good point. Uh, do you make pictures of the words that do you make a picture of the words themselves or, or the meaning of the words? Like in your book, you explained, uh, you were telling uh, the story of the horses in the track. Yeah. That's, that's a, a lesson. The, the horse story in my book is a lesson about listening visually and being able to read visually. Um, and Trying to do the meaning of a word is about learning vocabulary words, which is down the line. What we're doing with spelling words, all you got to do to be a good speller is have a good picture of the word in your mind's eye. And so right now, you're learning the first basic sub-skill. How can I hold a picture of a word in my mind's eye and stabilize it to the extent that I can spell it from left to right, or right from left? And then, then we move on to a spelling strategy. So let's move on to, we'll be doing a lot more stuff like this. So. Let me move on and get to the material out. So yeah, that's the way you know that you have a good quality picture in your mind's eye. <clears throat> Next, you need a retrieval system to have a good memory. Retrieval system means, I mean, if you stored something in your brain, when do you want to retrieve it? You don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, yeah, here's this math formula. You, know, you want to be able to retrieve it when you want to retrieve it. You want to be able to program your brain to give it to you when you need it. Okay, how do you do that? And what, how do we want it to be in school? What's the nature of our school when somebody's taking a test, for example, that we want them to bring up some stuff that we've had them memorize? Well, if you stop to think about the nature of schools, usually it's a very auditory place. They're going to be asked a question by the teacher or by one of their peers, or they're gonna read a test question. Most people, when they read test questions or when they read, they sub-vocalize. So that sets up in my mind that we want auditory to be the retrieval system. Now, how do we make that work? Well, one of the things you can do is like if you have a, uh, a word in your mind's eye, 
and you say the word while you're looking at it, your mind neurologically will hook it together. So you'll be hooking the picture together with the sound of the word or the sound of the math fact or whatever it is that you're trying to memorize. It's very, the operative word there is the word while. If you do two things in your brain at the same time, you will neurologically connect them together. For you NLP people, you're anchoring them together. It's pure and simple. All right? So, and I'll show you that when we get to the spelling strategies. If, if, um, if I give you something that's like seven times eight is 56, and you have a picture of that in your mind's eye, and then you look up at the picture and you go, okay, seven times eight is 56, and you say that while you're looking at that picture, again, you've just not only stored it visually, but you've connected a retrieval system to it that will give it to you when you want it. Because when you're, when you're multiplying like eight times 17, the way you do that is you go eight times seven is 56, carry the five, eight times one is eight, add the five is, is 13. Yes? So for the, um, in, in retrieval, does it make a difference if I'm using internal auditory or external auditory? Can I say it to myself or do I have to say it out loud? Either way. Either way. Right. So you can either say it out loud or to yourself, either one, doesn't make any difference. Now the last thing in my mind that you have to have in order to have good memory is how do you take it from short-term memory to long-term memory? And probably the easiest way to do that, the, the most humane way to do that, uh, is to just practice it over time. I mean, for those of you that know about phobias, uh, a phobia is a perfect example of a one-time memory lesson. You know, you, know you, you jump over a log and almost step on a snake, and from then on, any time you think about a snake, it's that, that phobic response, one-time learning. Well, we don't want to have a cattle prod or something like this, when somebody's learning a spelling word, we sit there and shock them and put them in some sort of emotional discharge. We, we want, um, what we want is for that, for the, when they, when they say a word and they picture the word, we want that connection to pop into their brain. So every time they say the word, there, there's a picture of it. So you do that by practicing over time. What I mean by over time, and let's, let's use an example like a, a spelling word, for example. Uh, if I give them a spelling word, I will have them picture it, and then they'll say the word while they're looking at it. And then I'll say, now, I want you to uh, say the word and pull it up and spell it um, three more times today. And then tomorrow, I want you to do it two times, sometime during the day, just while you're getting a drink of water, say the word and spell it. And maybe next week, do it one or two times so that it's spread out over time. If they do it like six to eight times, one, bang, 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 right, right in a row, it won't drop it into long-term memory. Okay? So in, in the learning strategies that you're going to pick up, you will find these elements in, embedded in all of the strategies. Yes? So is there a, a quantity? I mean, I know oftentimes what the kids get is 20 spelling words a week. Mm -hmm. and we'll, so ta we'll talk about when, oh, when, when, it, you get there. when we get to spelling. Great. Any questions about these things about memory, because we're about to break for lunch. Some of you say, well, lunch. Yes? Uh, well, I want to give uh, some feedback to uh, Robin. Robin. I just mentioned that I have no problem to remember the picture, and I had a problem to remember the word. And she said, how about putting the frame around it and the background? And I really started to create pictures from words mm -hmm. that work better for me. Yeah. And then so cool. he did it. Yeah. Then say what she did was go to submodalities to help you. For those of you that are not NLP, submodalities are like the uh, the different ways that you picture things. And there's a whole bunch of tricks there that I'm going to be sharing with you about how to how to do stuff like that. And again, this just embodies to me um, <coughs> that anything is possible with this. If somebody says I can't do that, I go, okay, what do we need to do to make it happen? You know, and so it's that can-do attitude I think that's so important about the joy processes. I just don't take no for an answer, basically, what it boils down to. Robin. And for the people that haven't had an LP or one before I got it, she gave it to me because she said, I can, I can see the picture. She pointed right at the picture and the frame. I can do that, but I can't do this. Look, the frame. So I just took it from her. Uh, come on. I'm pretty few, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mind me, uh, she's very auditory, 
and she learned how to spell when she was a baby with a book uh, that uh, how to teach your baby to read, and it was like uh, elephant. This, this, all these words, and and the baby didn't know anything, but just visualizing, so she learned how to visualize when she was a baby. All sorts of possibilities out there. Yes, one last question, then we'll break for lunch. I just find it interesting that the retrieval system that um, I think a lot of um, a lot of the challenges that I have is that I put it into short-term memory and I'm able to do it with the names and everything. It's like you can do it, but then when I go back, it's like, and it'll come to me. It's like I'll remember their name in the middle of the night. So yeah, that's there's, there's that to kind of compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. I never even thought of it that way, but. With the kids doing the repetitive words and everything, it must just go into short-term memory, and then it's gone. So when they do the test, there, there's nothing to retrieve because yeah. it's gone. What you'll, what you'll hear uh, kids say, or students of all ages actually say, is that I studied and I studied so hard for this test, and when I went in to take the test, it was gone. There wasn't anything there. I'd read the test question, and I knew I'd studied it, but I just couldn't find it. You know, it just My mind went blank. But when it says my mind went blank, that means there's no pictures there. Guess how they attempted to put it in there? They usually did the auditory strategy of sounding it out over and over again and never put any pictures in there at all. And when you do something over and over auditorily, that to me, that's a short-term memory um, deal. And it does not drop into long-term memory when you do that, unless you overlap it into another um, sense. Okay, so you're, you're going to run across that. <laughs> Hundreds of times the kids will say that to you, that I studied, I studied so hard for that test that I just didn't make it. Tomorrow morning, <clears throat> by the way, we're going to have a, um, an adult that, um, that I'm going to do a demonstration with. And she's going to bring her in. She's my insurance agent, actually. And she's very bright. She's one of the best insurance agents in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And her company is forcing her to become a financial planner. And she doesn't want to become a financial planner. And they're saying either that or give up your agency. So she's taken the financial planning test, I think, twice and flunked it. And she called me all frustrated. And I said, oh, you'll be a perfect demonstration <laughs> of how we help people in the world. So in the morning, I think, if, assuming everything goes right, she'll be here and uh, it'll show you how I do an assessment and how I move them into the learning strategies with a real live person that hadn't been sitting here listening to this type of thing. I think you'll, you'll like it. And assuming we can, at Santa, at Sandy can round up some more students tomorrow afternoon. You guys get to um, uh, work on students that will come in. If, if we can't find enough students, then we'll just work on each other because I can tell some of you need some help with your visualization. visualization right? <laughs> All right, let's break for lunch and be back at uh, 1 o'clock. So any lingering questions about uh, our memories and how our memories work and what's important to have in the learning strategies because this will be the backbone of most of the strategies. <clears throat> okay. So number three about the retrieval system, it's, it's um, for those of you that are in NLP, it's nothing more than an anchored response. I mean, it's pure and simple. Um, for those of you not in NLP, it's a conditioned response. You know, it's like when, <laughs> when somebody said, let's eat, and you start salivating. I mean, it's that type of deal, you know. Um, and the, the, the plan, the strategy is that we want you to store it visually. And then because schools are so auditory, we want to use auditory as the retrieval system. And you don't always do that. It's just because of the unique nature of learning and, and taking tests and stuff like this. Because when I work with athletes, for example, I don't have any auditory in there. What you want with athletes are VK. You want visual kinesthetic. You want to, they want to see somebody make a move and their body responds. They don't want to say, oh, he made a move. I think I'll respond. <laughs> I mean, you don't want that. So it's, it's specifically designed for the environment of a school. Does that make sense? So that, for example, um, and we'll, we'll show you how it works more explicitly when we do the spelling strategy, but when you put a spelling word in your mind, and then while you're looking at that word, you spell it. I mean, I'm sorry, you say the word. What that does is hook it together, because you're doing those two things simultaneously. Now when the teacher says, OK, class, the first word on your spelling list is Albuquerque, 
What I want is the sound of that word to pop the picture in your mind. You just copy it off. And it works that efficiently. I'm trying to apply it to myself how I store and how I store and retrieve things that I want to remember. Well, I, I would, you mean, just try, just try it out and see. Memory in general, remembering things in general. Remembering, 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 remembering incidents, remembering words. Um, my experience with uh, with memory is that if you don't if you don't store it someplace, you're not going to remember it. And if you don't program your brain to give it to you when you want it, then you're not going to be able to retrieve it when you want it, and you may get it sometimes when you don't want it. So they're both really important to have. And like I said, with a name remembering strategy, if um, <clears throat> if if you don't you don't store the information if you don't practice it uh, things like this then then you have all sorts of weird things happening so let's look, just try it out with these learning strategies and see if and uh, see if you get any of the awarenesses about what you do or not and then come back to me if you don't yes so if you're wanting to retrieve it for a test mm -hmm. then that would be when you would see it yeah when you read the test question okay so then you would be doing it audit yeah, what you want to happen is like if you, and you know, we'll get into this more when we learn to memorize data, but um, what I want to happen with your brain is that you store the information and then when you read the test question, you don't even have to go in and think about what the answer is, it just automatically pops right. in your brain, which makes learning really easy. Okay, but you, okay, you were saying when you want to retrieve it when you hear it, then you would see it at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to have it visual and retrieve it when you're reading it. Same thing, because most people, when they read, they sub-vocalize. Auditory, right. too. Okay. Right. So it would be the same process. Right. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> and again, like when, um, when I work with, work with athletes, like my son, for example, was, a, was an athlete. and. Um, there are various times that when he'd be, like he was taking karate or one of the martial arts. And so <laughs> young people, whenever they start learning martial arts, you know, what they do is go around with friends and go, rah, rah, you know, those kind of things. And that's what he was doing, was practicing in the living room all the time. And I watched him do this one time. He was practicing like a kick or something. And I said, um, what are you doing with your mind when you're practicing that kick? And he said, I'm just, just going over how to do it. And I said, would you like a suggestion so that you can be better at martial arts? Didn't even know I did good feedback. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'll take a suggestion. I said, instead of just mindlessly practicing the, the rep repetitive nature of the kick over and over again, think about when do you want to use a particular move? When do you want to do this kick, whatever the name of it was? And it was a kick like supposedly to the midsection of the, the opponent. And he said, well, if, they're, if, I, if I see their hands are getting up too high, or if I see they're dropping their hands down, then I want to go for the midsection. I said, okay. What I want you to do the next time you practice this kick is I want you to see in your mind's eye an opponent with their hands out of position, and then you do the kick so that you see do. And so he started practicing like that. He was brand new in, in, in karate. And uh, started practicing all of his moves like that. <clears throat> He started like in January, I think, and in April he had his first tournament. And he, w he got into the heavyweight division of the tournament, and he won his section, hands down. I mean, he not only won it, he stomped them. I mean, he just, he beat them handily. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, the, the concept of being able to do things when you want to do them is really a nice concept as far as being able to utilize your brain and make it more useful to you, I guess, would be a way to say it. So let's move on. One more question. I was just going to say, if I work with an athlete, uh -huh. I tell them to do it with their subconscious mind. Don't even bring their conscious mind into it, because the subconscious mind functions so much faster. Sure. So what I tell them is, for the first, and what I'll tell you all, what I want you to do is, is practice, con practice these strategies consciously, deliberately, and intentionally until it's no longer at the conscious level and you're just doing it automatically. So it's the same thing. 
Okay, let's move on. Let's do the spelling strategy. Are you ready to do the spelling strategy? Yes. Let's do the spelling strategy. 